Hi, everybody. Um, it's Blair here. Hope you guys are doing well. Um, I have a fun interview today for you with my friend Heidi Parks, who is in, you're in Milwaukee. Is that right? I am. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm in Santa Fe. Heidi's in Milwaukee. I, uh, we both teach for Creative Bug, and uh, I sort of used your class or your daily practice class when I was filming my chicken bug or my chicken scratch for Creative Bug a daily practice class and uh, just sort of to learn the cadence of like how a daily practice series works and by the end of it I wanted to drop the chicken scratch embroidery and just pick up a quilt or a piece of fabric and start using your props it was so fun oh Blair I had no idea that you did that yeah I, I did need to do that <laughs> it was so fun it was so fun so tell us, you're in Milwaukee, tell us a little bit about your current uh, creative world, like in a nutshell, so we can get started. Everybody knows where to find you. Okay, beautiful. I moved to Milwaukee in 2015 from Chicago. That's where I did my growing up. And here I am. I, I like to think that I'm kind of nimble and straddle three different worlds. So connected to creative bug, especially I'm part of the makers movement and inspiring people to make things on their own. And I teach a lot of classes on quilting and mending clothing. And I have some quilt patterns. And when I first thought about making a pattern, which is a savvy thing to do if you're a quilter, I didn't like the... It felt too boring to have to follow a pattern and do it exactly the way that the teacher did it. And I wanted to find a way that I could recreate for students the way that I feel, which is curious. So a lot of my patterns are prompt based and I'll be asking you to trace a body part and put it on the quilt or do something to note your birth, but it doesn't have to be a calendar of your birthday. It could be, for example, a Google image of the hospital you were born in and, and that there are lots of creative ways to respond. I also am very active in the quilt world and I love that space. I just recently took a class at the Wisconsin Museum of Quilts and Fiber Art, which is just north of Milwaukee. And I'm going to be teaching there this upcoming October. I've got an improvisational hand quilting class that I'm teaching there. I also am in a show called Quilt National at the Dairy Barn in Athens, Ohio. And that quilt is a travel diary quilt that I made when I was in Santa Fe teaching and traveling. My grandmother lived there when I was in elementary school and junior high. And it's one of my tip top favorite places to go and reminisce no, I, about. Yeah, so, yeah, that's great. Yeah, so I just, I feel extra exciting to me to be able to talk to you from Santa Fe. And yeah. Um, um, yeah, I do a lot of travel diary quilts in general. I'm going to be teaching quilting in September, this September 2023 in France. And right now I'm uh, promoting two retreats that I'll be doing in the spring in Japan and in England, where we'll be traveling and quilting. And then the last place where you can find me is the art world. I have a solo show up right now at the Lee Yockey Woodson Art Museum in Wausau, Wisconsin. And I, I went to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and have a pretty conceptual background. I certainly was doing ceramics and then painting before I was working with, with fabric in a serious way, making quilts. So I think that is a, a visually apparent component of what I do as a quilter. I love that you're doing so many different things and, and what the reason or one of the main reasons I really wanted us to chat was because I, I come to quilting from um, a textile background. I didn't grow up with quilters, but um, I look at, or I looked at quilting early on as sort of like a, a, a photo album, if you will, of like, you know, like, fabric from my daughter's baby's room curtains or something like that and so I love that your prompts for your quilts 
tap into that personal connection to quilting. I think you um, you had, um, I think in your Crave Book class that I watched, you had it, you traced a cell phone. You know, it's such a simple shape. And, but it's interesting to have that shape be roughly the size of this thing that you have in your hand. I know I have it in my hand every day or in my back pocket or, you know, <laughs> such, and it's so vital to my life and my business. It's how I connect with my kids. And um, so it's interesting. I, I really have an appreciation for that sort of emotional pull of uh, not just the fabric, which is how I come to it. It's like old fabric and a collection of fabrics that have um, like a smell, like my grandmother's house or, you know, something like that. All of that is what attracted me to quilting originally. And it sounds like some of that same kind of influence attracted you to it as well. Yes, definitely. Yeah. My grandmother organized a quilt before I was born that all of my, a lot of family and friends contributed to. And then they also made, I think, the curtains and the crib stuff for me with a very particular green fabric with little red and yellow and orange berries on it. And I still have some of that leftover yardage and it shows up in my quilt sometimes. And having access to that fabric as a marker of my birth is, is so special. And then when I learn about quilts, I think one of the common stories about quilting is that you are repurposing fabric or scraps from things. So it's either a piece of your dress or it's the scrap from cutting out the dress that ends up in the quilt. And for example, I've got a diary quilt behind me that I began in November and I just finished very recently. And this, this orange tank top is something that I wore a lot. I mended it too. The strap started to come apart. I wore it for about 10 years and then hadn't worn it for at least eight years. And it felt fun to finally admit it's not part of my wardrobe anymore but it is infused with that energy of me having worn it for so long and to put that in a quilt and, and also mark the moment of, okay, I know, I know I'm not gonna go back to that garment, but how can it continue to be part of how I move forward? This is also a pink t-shirt sweater that I, that I also recently retired. And I love that storytelling element of a garment yeah. when it, still in your routine. Yeah, yeah keep some of that identity in the quilt instead of just becoming an orange square where you can't tell where it came from right yeah oh I love that I love that because I do think that um quilt making I know for me um quilt making is such a I don't work on quilts when I'm like like I don't get super stressed working on quilts. Like it kind of relaxes me. And, and oftentimes uh, students or people will say, well, I don't have the patience to make a quilt. And I always respond with like, I don't have any patience. But when you break down the process of quilt making, gathering the fabrics, deciding what you want to use, cutting the fabrics, piecing the fabrics, you realize you just have to have a little bit of patience for each one of those segments. And just when you, you know, just when I think I can't cut another piece of fabric or can't like decide another thing, then you're ready to move on to whatever is next. So I think that that, that to me tells the story of the process of making a quilt. Like it tells the story of you deciding what you put in that quilt, but also the quilt itself becomes like its own narrative, which I think is really very cool. I love that. It's very fun. And my son goes to DePaul in oh. Chicago. Yeah. Yeah. So, Chicago so we both place. have connections with where yeah. the other lives. I, I used to like go visit him once or twice for a long weekend. But oh, yeah, we love Chicago. Let me know next time you're in Chicago. I will. Very I will. close to me. So um, who would you say, I'm curious, like, who are your biggest influences in mm -hmm. quilting? Like, our artists, really. Uh-huh. So, 
I've been reflecting about that a lot lately, actually, because in October, I'm going to be teaching a diary quilting class. And this quilt I made partly during a January diary quilting series where we met on Zoom all month in January. And I want this iteration of diary quilting to be fresh so that people can repeat the class if they want and not have it be similar information. And in this class, I was thinking a lot about memoir and fairy tale. And we had a guest instructor named Janelle Hardy who got to participate and teach on the first, the first section. And that was such an interesting influence of thinking about authors and writing and what is a written down diary and how can that impact and influence things. And in this iteration of the series, I want to go back and share about my college professors who were particularly influential to me. I graduated in 2005 and I feel very lucky that I'm still in touch with them and get to keep track of how, how their creative thinking is continuing to evolve. So Anne Wilson is a Chicago artist and professor at the Art Institute. And I took a class from her called Art and the Everyday. Um, forget exactly, the but it was Everyday Ordinary was the focus of the semester long class. And you sharing about your connection to a cell phone and how you have it every day. And it's this regular object that you can forget about, or you can even start to complain about. And then you have to remember, oh yeah, it's a gift that we have social media. It's a gift that we have a cell phone. It's such an interesting part of our everyday life. And then how can that become part of the work or the quilt? And she inspired me tremendously in the class that we took. And was showing examples of art where folks would crochet dental floss as a regular item and suddenly the floss would create a bag to hold the little plastic container that the floss came in and and so her work and her way of thinking about everyday items inspired me a lot and then Diana Guerrero Macia is another professor that I had she taught my first quilting class and first fiber art class. Mostly I made quilts out of books in her class. She typically will use felt to make quilts, but she refers to them as paintings. And I love, love that way of speaking. I would say Mark Bradford is another huge art inspiration of mine. And he for a long time was ripping down posters from the street, collaging them onto bed sheets, sanding them, collaging wow. more adding string and and he's a huge influence also and, and speaking of using everyday ordinary items definitely did that in addition yeah. to calling his collages paintings and Deanna's work has a lot to do with codes and code switching she's a Cuban artist who lives here in America and her she in her family she did a lot of code switching and and shifting identities and she has a tremendous amount of code in her her quilts and in her art and when i think about diary quilting or sharing things it's fun to have codes and ways of maintaining a little bit of privacy so i can do that raw you know no one wants their diary read it's private information you go back a decade later and reread it and sort of Makes I know, me I don't even want to read it. <laughs> oh, it's awful. It's so awful to read the things that go in diaries. And her influence with code, I think, has allowed me to be able to do the good work of diaries and the reflection and getting in the muck the way you have to in order to learn in that present moment way. But then also it can start to look beautiful and interesting. Yeah. And, and that reference to code and that way of thinking about quilts, the class was called sampling. And she was talking about the way that a DJ samples sound and puts it in their music and the way that a quilt would have a sampler or a crazy quilt would have special fabrics from a variety of places. Yeah. That that's something that we can invite into our art, whether we're making a traditional quilt or not, was yeah. a huge part of the class. And incredibly inspiring to me. So those are, I'd say, three big inspirations and influences. Well, and that's really interesting to me, because as you were saying that, I'm thinking to myself, you know, I did when we moved from Seattle to Santa Fe, 
I did um, sit down one afternoon and read through the journal that I had written in. I'm not much of a journal keeper, but I had read, I, I kept one when I had my first apartment and I was in my, um, I guess, mid twenties, um, very angsty, you know, it was like everything was, you know, but it's interesting how I wasn't ready to, to just get rid of it yet. So I just um, put it back where it was, but it's interesting how a quilt, if you're, if you're sort of taking the muck, you can respond to it and reframe it in with textiles and with stitching in a totally different way in a quilt. So you can almost like make it beautiful or layered or interesting. It doesn't have to be like, you know, I had a panic attack today, <laughs> you, <can laughs> it, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and, and you know, it's like, I had forgotten a lot of, of those feelings that I had back in my 20s. And so it is interesting to revisit them from a much older uh, perspective. It also helped me understand my kids a lot more too. So I was like, okay, so I was the same way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's wild looking back at them. I took out a lot of my old diaries and took photos of them. One of my local artist friends, Elena Parnell, is another Art Institute graduate. And she teaches at the, the art school here in Milwaukee, um, University of Wisconsin. And she photographs her diaries and that is her art. And she just shares the actual writing that she wrote. Wow. Sort of blew me away that she had the courage to do that. And then also the verbal skills to share about what she's doing and articulate all the reasons and the details. And I went back and looked at my diaries because of that and because I was teaching diary quilting. And another element that I did, and I'd be curious since you just looked back through some of your diaries, if this came up as well, but I did a lot of planning for the future in my diaries. I would write down like, what were the traits that I wanted in an ideal partner? Or who do I want to become better friends with? Or where, like what jobs could I have in the future? And that type of planning and daydreaming is so different from autobiography. And I think is integral to diary of just figuring out what do I want yeah. and what direction am I going in? And I think a quilt can very much be something for that too. And not just in this diary quilting way that I do, but when I think about the baby quilt that was made for me, it's literal dreams for who I will become. And there's cross stitch that says, welcome to life, little one. And that that's just a deep and important part of quilting and the amount of people who make quilts for all the babies in their family. Yeah. Or when there's a wedding, they make a quilt. That's so future dream wish yes. oriented. Kind of, yeah, you're kind of thinking ahead. Like, yeah, because when I, I look back, the one thing I did in my journals was uh, a lot of goal setting. You know, it's like, what I want to do, like what I, where I want to live, you know, and uh, yeah, you're right. It, it can all be, uh, those ideas can be really effectively played with in some sort of uh, quilt narrative that you form for yourself. I love that. Yeah. Um, so what is your favorite time of day to quilt? Because I know that you do mainly, do you mainly do hand quilting? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Favorite time of day? Mm. Certainly the time I quilt the most is in the evening. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not a morning person. So say I wake up around 10, I get all my, I get my coffee, I get going by around 11. And then generally I want to try and get an Instagram post done and then, uh, check in with my email or tackle a project. And so then it's later in the day that I'm typically like, ah, oh, okay. Yeah. Checked a few things off of that goal list because we're both very yes. driven women. And then I, I like to sit back and do some quilting. I was just uh, doing the artist residency at the uh, 
Woodson Art Museum where my show is up. And that was such a fun way to step back and do a little more sewing and a little less. You could quilt all day or you could work mm -hmm. on a quilt. We had some open studio time. So I was in and teaching hand yoga to people and showing them how to get started and doing a little sample stitching and taught some classes. And then in the evenings, I just got to be in this gorgeous new glass box studio that they built. And, and I watched The Witcher. I had I, I watched almost all of The Witcher while I was there. So it gives you a sense of how much time I spent watching. The Witcher. Yeah. Three yeah. seasons. No, yeah. It's a series. It's a movie, right? It's, a it's so, yeah, it was so dreamy and magical. And I'm okay. very interested in watching fun TV and doing my quilting. Yeah. So that is a favorite time. And then I would say another favorite time is maybe partially even an answer to what you brought up with patience. I love thinking about Stephanie Pearl McPhee. She's a knitter and a writer about knitting. And she always responds that she doesn't have the patience to not knit. And I think I don't have the patience to not quilt. <laughs> so my, my other favorite time to quilt is when I'm out and about in the world and I have a stolen moment. And that's generally more for quilt tops rather than the actual quilting because that's so big. So when I'm making the quilt top, I can tuck it into a little tote bag or even just grab a scrap of fabric and stitch on that and then applique it to the quilt later. I don't have to be bringing the whole thing with me. But if I'm in a meeting, if I'm on Zoom, if I'm you know, planning for, the, I'm about to be in France and we spent a lot of time doing four hour long Zoom marathon meetings, planning all of that. And every time I was stitching as well. And then I could show up and be patient and present and plan and do everything. And I'd get done with the meeting and I wouldn't feel deflated the way a person might after a four hour meeting. But instead I'd think, gosh, I got all that sewing done and I totally understand the vision for the trip. And we were able to dig into every important detail. And so that is my other favorite time. If I'm on an airplane, if I'm in a meeting, if I'm waiting for an appointment at the doctor's office. I've got my sewing with me so that I can be the best, most patient, kindest version of Heidi that there can be in the world. When I do find that uh, I've noticed I can focus on a, a meeting agenda if I'm, because hand stitching can relax us and it just sort of like slows my breathing down. It helps me to just kind of be a little bit more present. And so even, um, I didn't even notice that until probably I started uh, doing more like chicken scratch embroidery and, and things like that. So I, um, yeah, I think when you're on a Zoom meeting, if you can do some stitching or even at night, I find, uh, like if my husband and I want to sit down and watch a movie, sometimes it's hard to switch gears, even if it's time for you to relax and you've turned your computer off, you've turned your sewing machine off. Sometimes it's hard to just switch gears immediately. And so I find that if I have something to stitch, I can relax a little bit more, which drives him crazy because I don't have it ready when he's ready to sit down and watch. And so it's like this whole, like, he's like, Blair, let's watch this. And I'm like, okay, give me a minute. And then it'll take me 30 minutes to set up my little square. <laughs> better at that. But yeah, I totally understand that. Yeah. And you meant, you touched on your hand yoga. Mm -hmm. You're a yoga instructor. So you're very well versed in like the benefits of yoga in general, but you do a lot of hand yoga to help quilters. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah. I am certified in vinyasa flow yoga and also in yoga therapy, which is traditionally a one-on-one -on -one healing that is intimately connected to Ayurveda. And this idea that the body is connected to the five elements, earth, air, water, um, fire, and space, ether, the space in between things, which is one of my favorites. and. Then I also have been quilting on fabric since 2013. 
And around 2016, 17, I was starting to have some pain in my hands, especially because I was using an all metal thimble and it was squeezing and squishing on my thimble finger. And I got this intense, awful nerve pain where if I had done that back then, it would have shot all the way up my arm. And so I changed symbols. And then six months later, I still had the same pain and kept being, a, a, you know, annoying my doctor about it. And he referred me to an occupational therapist. And that was unbelievable to me. Like the, the pain that I had been having in my finger, sometimes in my elbow, sometimes on that wing under my shoulder blade was all starting to add up. And I think I was aggravating it more by teaching six to nine yoga classes a week rather than having the yoga be the antidote to all of the quilting. So occupational therapy was so eye-opening to me. I now have usually zero pain in my body and the way that they can reverse that rather than just stop it from getting worse Mm -hmm. blew my mind. And I also saw a lot of potential for what I knew about yoga to add to and benefit and uh, complement what I was learning about occupational therapy. Because in OT, it was just one, two, three, and you have to count and do 10 reps of everything. And they're very sterile. And I wasn't inspired to come home and do the homework. Like but for hands. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's just like, I, who wants to just count the whole time in their head? So I started to create these small vinyasa flows that were very inspired by the occupational therapy movements. And with those principles in mind that, for example, motion is lotion and gentle movements for your hand are what are going to be satisfying. So just gently opening and closing my hands. Not 100% open, not 100% closed, but like in that 70% land. Yeah. That was the first ever occupational homework that I ever had. And still to this day, the most powerful advice that I can give people because we're always pushing, pulling, tugging, engaging, squeezing, forcing. And you don't have to do an intense opposite thing to heal that. What you need instead is a gentle movement that can lubricate the joints and allow them to move freely. So I try to do that when I'm walking or to create a a flow in my day. And then there are also these beautiful sequences that are very vinyasa flow inspired for me where I'll go through them and then, oh, I can remember it and I can just connect to my breathing rather than counting. And that type of sequence just like fills my cup in three or four minutes. And, yeah. and, and so that's a big part of what I'm excited to share with people on. And, and I have so much of that on my YouTube channel for free. It's the that. thing that oh, I good. think I'm most, most generous think, with is the yeah, hand yoga. So that people can try it because yeah. I know that um, inside of my membership, we meet uh, regularly online. And I know that there are, um, you know, people that have challenges with like holding, um, quilting rulers and holding their rotary cutters. And, you know, it's like, I know when I free motion quilt, my shoulders are up like this and oh, yeah. you know, it's, there's plenty of, of repetitive movements that we need to really take care of. We want to be doing this for a long time mm-hmm. and we need to take care of it for sure. Yeah, no, I think that's great. Um, well, gatherings like that are so important too, because I think it can be easy to add hand yoga to the list of shoulds and then not actually implement it or or do it. And so, you know, even if you were to say, let's all do one of Heidi's hand yoga things together at the beginning of, of your session that you do, yeah. that reminder to do it would yeah. be so powerful. And, and, and it, like those things I get really jazzed about too with habits and how do you infuse it in your life. And one yeah, of my favorite yeah, things with yoga yeah. classes is you're with other people and you're doing it together. And that kind of spark is yeah, it's great. Yes, it really is. I agree. Uh do you have a favorite quilt that you've made? <laughs> um I have a few that 
feel particularly special to me. Yeah. And it's oftentimes not so dramatically about how they look, but more about what I learned when I was making them, whether I was trying to reframe something in my life and I was using the quilt as a tool to do that, or it was a big aha moment with technique. And I would say a quilt that did both of those things is a three foot by three foot quilt that I made that stretched on a wooden frame and it's called, but what was it like? And that quilt for me had some, some very powerful reframing about how I was dating and what I, who I was looking for when I was dating and, and not wanting to settle for scraps of affection or scraps of attention and being really aware that I would go back through my text messages on my phone, like a detective. Oh, was there something I could have done? Or could I have realized sooner that he was interested in something yeah. that I wasn't interested in or vice versa? And, and so I had that idea then to look at my actual scraps in my studio and make that comparison of scraps of attention and scraps of fabric. And, and so I put those scraps in the quilt and I layered them underneath some silk chiffons so that I didn't have to turn the edges or cut them or make them different from what they were. And, and so those aha moments were very exciting for me. And it's a, a quilt that I love. Yeah. And often I'll make a quilt and it's like the quilt itself may not be my favorite quilt, but maybe it's what was happening in my life during that quilt making process or like if I um I've read some really eye-opening or I've listened to some really eye-opening books while making a particular quilt and so I have these um familiar positive feelings with that quilt or you know there's one quilt that I made probably back in I don't know 2007 or something and or some somewhere around then and it's like if I hear Coldplay mm -hmm. I think about that quilt because that was what I listened to almost non-stop at that point I think they it was whenever they had a new their first album or something but anyway um yeah that can often be like often it's not I know for well and, and the quilt that I made for my uh daughter when she'd outgrown her first year clothes and I just took like the curtains like I was telling you and little snippets from the crib bumpers and you know she uh had all these really sweet clothes and we and maybe they were stained and so we would just cut little pieces from them that quilt was made um in such a like inexperienced way because there was no google there was you know no teacher that I had who could help me and it's I tell people, it's like, I didn't even understand when I made Emma's quilt that the edges of the quilt were actually uh, binding that wrapped around the edges. I thought it was piping that came through the center, like a pillow. So it's like huh. I sandwiched the whole thing right sides together like a pillow and so, <laughs> and so, bind, huh. so you know, just binding or piping coming out from the sides, you know, so Oh, I yeah. love that. I want to bind a quilt like that now. I can see how I can so do it. Weird. It was so weird. But I had, and then the funny thing is about that quilt uh, is that when I finished it, I didn't understand how quilts were, like the layers were attached together. I thought the only way you could attach the layers yourself without having some huge machine was to tie them. Mm -hmm. So I just tied uh, the corners of all of the blocks and I tied, I was a big knitter at that time. So I tied them uh, with wool yarn. So when I washed the quilt, I thought quilts had to be washed immediately after making. When I washed it, all of the little ties, because they were wool, they felt it up. And so it turned into these little pom-poms, which is kind of, I mean, pom-pom shape. But then the funny part is, is that down like the lower quarter of the quilt has no ties on it because that's when I had her brother. <laughs> I, just, like, I have no time to do this anymore. So that quilt tells quite a story 
Mm -hmm. um, even though it wasn't like, you know, technically uh, anywhere near what I know now, you know, but it's still, it's still pretty endearing, I think. Yeah, oh, I get it. Yeah. I love um, looking into things like that. Like you run out of time or you just get bored with a certain technique and then then I'll just let myself change and keep finishing. Like I have quilts that are partly running stitch and partly tied and it's, it's fun to just yeah. not feel stuck, but to try what That's you feel like making. Not feel stuck, to just mm -hmm. break through, not feel like you have to continue until it's done with a certain way of doing it it's mm -hmm. okay to break the rules make your own rules and things like that and and yeah i love that um so let let let's talk a little bit about your um your quilting practice so do you um do you do you quilt every day i mean it's so different for us when we're actually like do it you know when we're doing this like to to live basically uh -huh. this business and you know what's that old saying be careful turning something you love into your business um but i've had fun with it so how to speak to that a little bit in your world yeah yeah no i love that question and i think it's a unique one for those of us who have turned the thing we love into our job i do not quilt every day i am a bit of a I, I don't like, I just like marathon style things and I connect with being more of a monotasker. Like I don't typically have tons of quilts in progress and maybe I finish them. Maybe I don't. I, I, because of my job, I have to have more quilts in progress at one time than I would like to, because I need to demo something or make a quilt in secret for creative bug and then reveal it several months later. But generally I would be making just one or two quilts at a time would be my ideal where I would have something I'm quilting and then something I'm piecing. And I also enjoy as a daily rhythm, like if I'm going to work on the email newsletter, I'll do that all day. Or if I'm going to do website updates, that's the thing I'm doing. And it doesn't feel so good to me to do an hour of this and then an hour of that and then change course. So yeah, I don't, I don't sew every day, but then sometimes I have days where I sew for 10 hours. And yeah. then I also do try to make sure that I, at a moment's notice can grab something. And then if I have a meeting or an occasion where I could be stitching, maybe even if I don't know what it's for, I'll just grab some fabric and thread and I'll figure out, I'll, I'll work it into something later. But my, yeah, in terms of daily rhythm, I don't, I don't have so much of a daily rhythm, <laughs> but it's it, whatever it is that's going on. So right now I'm getting ready to have my intern come back in town. And next week, we're going to tackle a bunch of projects together because it's my last week with her and she's been off at Penland doing things previously. So we'll be cleaning the studio together and working on Pinterest and doing some other shared projects that are awesome to have help with and then the next week I'm teaching at Woodland Ridge Retreat so I'll be there hopefully then I will be sewing every day and I'm very much looking forward to that and then I'll be home for a week and then I'll be teaching in France for a while so it just it it changes too much to have yeah. a lot of daily routines flow. yeah yeah and do you keep a sketchbook because I don't keep a sketchbook anymore mm -hmm. I pretty much do all of my designing on in adobe illustrator oh. uh, which i used to do but i came from the apparel design industry so i still have like a lot of tear sheets for magazines and things like that so do you keep a sketchbook i do not i i tend to try to stay curious about the actual quilt so i do very little planning so planning. Maybe my yeah. sketchbook would be the practice of i'll grab something and sew and then trust that it can become part of something later i do what be like a sketchbook that i do i i do a fair amount of journaling and notebook 
keeping like like I often have places where I keep notes. So if I'm having a meeting with someone, I've got a notepad where I'm adding things to like this kind of a thing. And then I might look back through there, but it's more about concepts or things that are going on in my life. Like I definitely have a health notepad. And then if I'm seeing my therapist, I jot down notes or meeting with my naturopath or something else. And then that might go into a quilt because I'm tracking the things that are happening in my life. I also enjoy using a lot of apps on my phone. So I have a Fitbit that I wear and different, different things like that, that then are interesting data to import into the quilt. Uh, this year I've been doing Noom and was listening to all the, the things and trying to be on a weight loss journey. And I've been weighing my food with a scale sometimes and then knowing how much I had. And so like, this is a, I traced the shape of my little food scale and I drew, I embroidered grapes on it because Noom has a big thing about grapes versus raisins and caloric density. So like, that was in my health notepad and on my phone. And then that became part of the quilt. So that's right. probably the closest that I have to a sketchbook. Oh, great. I know my husband and I used my fitness pal and we just, and it really taught me portion sizes, mm -hmm. which has stuck with me. So yeah, those apps, I love any kind of app that makes me be a better version of myself. Mm -hmm. All about it. Yeah. Yeah. My sister-in-law did my fitness pal and loved it. And then I, yeah, yeah I landed with Noom and yeah, it yeah. blew my mind. Like who knew what a serving of peanut butter was like? I sure didn't. I know I didn't either. And that was really my whole issue. It wasn't that I was like snacking incessantly. It was just that I didn't, I needed to just like remind myself what portion sizes look like. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I've been seeing my boyfriend do it for a few years. And I was like, oh, it's just because you're a man that <laughs> calorie counting works for you. And, and it was it's so empowering to do something that actually worked yeah. rather than feeling deprived and trying to avoid a food that I love for a few months yeah. and then obviously falling off the wagon because that's not sustainable. No, no, exactly. And my yeah. husband's a cyclist, so he was mm. doing my fitness pal and then he would sit down with me at night and say well I've got you know basically 3,000 calories left and I was like I have 12. <laughs> I can't even I have 3,000 calories that's amazing he has that many left. So that's another reason why if I have like handwork that I can sew mm -hmm. I'm not like tempted because he'll just sit and snack and he actually yes. needs to yeah. Yeah so. having something to do with my hands. That's not nibble. It's very helpful. Yeah, so can you tell us before we go a little bit about the quilts behind you? You told us about the top one. Yeah, yeah. So this one is what I made in my diary quilting class. And then I quilted it while watching The Witcher. And this one is a quilt that I made while during the pandemic. I started it in April 2020. And it was a daily practice that I made for myself in sync with the 100 day project. Mm -hmm. and, and so I added to it every day. And of course, some days I didn't add to it and then I made up for it a couple of days after, but it was that general idea that I was losing, losing track of time and not understanding how much time had passed, not realizing that it was spring and the quilt helped me stay in touch with time. And as the quilt got more and more full, I had to face the reality that time had passed, that I wasn't in some kind of vortex where time ceased to exist. So yeah. um, that's this quilt. Below it is a white scrap quilt. Uh, this is the third that I've made in this series. And it's such a fun way of watching what I frequently do and noticing if I've made a lot of circles or I back most of my quilts to avoid decision fatigue. I try to not be too complex with the backs of the quilts. So I just use wide cotton muslin yardage, unbleached. Yeah. And then I like to do a self-bound quilt lately where I wrap the backing to the front and then I don't have to iron binding strips because I don't yeah. like using the iron that way. Yeah. <laughs> and then I end up because my quilts, 
Yeah, yeah. My quilts shift a little. I only based like on a 12 inch grid so they can move. So I end up with this long scrap that's two inches wide by 20 feet long. And then what do I do with them? So they go in the scrap quilts now. And at the tippy top here is one of the very first quilts that I ever made. It's called Places Unfold. It was in QuiltCon 2016. And that one was attuned to my previous life as a high school art teacher. I liked that I was working with these 11 inch squares because I could put them in a little tote bag and maybe prep them. At the time, my friend Kat and I would get together every Tuesday night to craft together. And so on Tuesday night, I'd make a plan and set up a couple of things to sew. And then I'd have them in my bag so that if I had to proctor a test or do cafeteria duty or the kids in class didn't, you know, if it was just a work day, I liked to sit and make art alongside them. And, and it gave me something to do and to just model making. And, and so that worked out really well for me to be a block based quilt. And yeah, and that's the one on the top. That's and right cool. now with Creative Bug, I'm doing a quilt along that's called the Love Letter Quilt. And that is my first quilt pattern that is a block based quilt. And, okay. and, and it's letter sized, like seven by five to, to represent more of a letter. This one is square blocks, but I looked at that quilt a lot when I was planning that quilt pattern and just reminding myself of what I love about working with blocks to make a quilt. I love that. I love that very much. I, it's so fun to talk to you. Um, so you um, are going to France and I'm sure we'll see, everybody should follow Heidi because she's gonna be sharing a lot that she's doing um, in France while she's there. Yeah. And since we can't fit in your suitcase, we'll just watch yeah. what you're doing. And uh, yeah, she's gonna do another video for me and the Quilt is Desire Club coming up next, but thank you for being with us. It's so fun to talk to you and talk quilting with you. And we will have all of the links of where you can find Heidi and uh, take her classes on Creative Bug and all of that below. But if you have questions or comments, you can let us know and we will be sure and answer them. All right. Thank you, Heidi. Thank Safe you. Travel. Oh, it's so fun to be in Santa Fe for a few hours. I'm back. <laughs> yeah. Time. I'm back. <laughs> all right. Talk to you soon. Thank you.